Have you ever received a copy of a recipe from a famous restaurant or copied portions of the design or layout, let's say, of your neighbor's deck? I have. Frequently, I've been asked by viewers how they could copy all or a part of their favorite jacket or skirt. They'd like to make another version, perhaps this time with the end result of a better fit. It's time to learn. In this second episode of the two-part series on copycat patterns, I'll show you how to start with a ready-made garment that you own and create a pattern. Here's one of my favorite jackets. It's a little short for me, but then most clothes that I buy are. With the techniques that I'm about to share with you, I copied the pattern and added length, making it more my own. Copycat patterns, that's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads, because creativity is never black and white. Koala Studios, fine sewing furniture custom built in America. Clover, makers of sewing, knitting, quilting, and embroidery products for over 25 years. Experience the Clover difference. Amazing designs and Class A needles. During the first program of copycat patterns, I detail all the supplies that you'll need. And we're going to do a quick review right now. I'm working on a padded surface, and it's laid on top of my regular demonstration table. It's foam core that has been covered with fabric. You could use cardboard or foam core. Just You wouldn't even have to cover it with fabric if you don't want to. I have it covered for a contrast purpose. But then the tools, tracing wheels are important. Uh, spiked or normal or just the straight edge. I sometimes use this for marking hems. A variety of marking tools, straight edges, French curves, small little tools for adding seam allowances and hem allowances, and then some pens or pencils. And pins, of course, for working with the paper. Now the paper is practically the most important part of this series, not the fabric. You'll need pattern tracing paper or wax paper. And then this is the tracing paper that you ne normally work use for transferring darts or markings. We're going to use it to transferring the lines of our new pattern. Now the jacket that I remade from the original is longer. I'm a little taller than average. And I like this pattern very well because of the shaping and this, particularly in the back. It has a nice little inverted pleat that I found comfortable to wear. In this stage of working with the copycat patterns, I'm going to show you how to add tucks or perhaps gathers and also work with darts. If your pattern, your original pattern has darts in it or your original garment has darts, how to apply those to your new pattern piece. Notice the pockets. My original had pockets. Well, we have pockets here, but they're just fake ones. So I made it really simple and just put the flap on with not the functioning pocket. So I can make it as simple or as detailed as I would like. The first step when working with your garment is to analyze it and to say where are the details I have to look at. The dart is in the neckline rather than at the underarm area. It's right in this area, kind of an unusual placement, but that's what gives it some of the style. The grain line is along the center front. It's cut straight in the grain, and then you can see the functioning pocket that I just made, kind of a faux pocket. We're going to review some of the basic copycat techniques that we worked with in program one, the stage one and stage two, if you were with us during this program, and just to review how to do the tracing. Now, I've already marked on my pattern or my fit paper the center front line. There's a line that's black that I've marked, and I would place the tracing paper just scant, right side down, just scant from that center front marking. So I can see where that marking lies. And then start with the grain line as the initial guideline. And because this is fabric, it's bowed a little bit, but I know that the fabric wanted to be, or should be, on this straight of grain. So I'm pitting through the padded surface, making sure it's straight. Now, you're going to see the dart, and that's the key to this area. And you need to know how large or wide the dart underlay is. Now, I can feel the tuck of the dart, and it's between my two thumbs. And when I measure this, 
I'm just going to quickly measure this. It's about three eighths of an inch. Let me just double check that. Three eighths of an inch in depth. So double that would be three fourths of an inch would be the amount of fabric allowed in this section. Keep that in mind. You'll have to measure your dart underlay or you'll measure later on the tuck or the gathers. That's how you know how much to allow to your pattern piece. Now you're not going to make a pattern for sale. This is for your own use. You already purchased the garment. You just want to make it again or use portions of it again and start with the flattest area of the garment to begin with. So I've laid out the center front, the hemline, and I'm going to start to work at the side seam. Smooth it out, but don't stretch the fabric. We can manipulate the fabric a little bit as we go along. And I'll smooth it to a, it really gets pretty smooth into the underarm area. So as you might guess, I've already traced the center front and then using one of the tracing tools, now if you'd like to lengthen or shorten now would be the time and I'm just going to follow with this for simplicity sake and follow the hemline. And double check that you are marking through to the underside. I can see a slight red marking and even the perforation of the tracing wheel, let me angle this toward you, will help you know where the marking should be. So I'll continue marking the hem and then the side seam. You don't have to take your garment apart, you just have to follow these basic guidelines. And then I'm making a cross hatch at the underarm seam. That is the pocket, so I want to know where that pocket is. So I will just mark the pocket placement. And if you'd like to use a straight edge at this point, might be a better idea than just this quickness. Now we're going to go back to the neckline. And remember that dart, I need to allow some shaping in the dart. So I'm going to trace from the center front at the neckline seam to the dart and place a hatch mark at the dart and then pinpoint it at the end of the dart. So now I know the first dart leg and now I need to shape it in this area. So I'm going to release some of the pins because I've already established this and it was 3 eighths of an inch. So over I would have to go by 3 fourths of an inch. So double that because I measured if you recall there's 3 fourths of an inch and that's where I'm going to place now this area. And this will allow me to move that dart area in this area. And I'm going to keep it anchored a few places and then flatten out the rest of the, oop, this came undone. Let's hope that's where it was. It's a, that's why it works so well to be on a padded surface because you can poke right through the fabrics and hold this taut. Here's my dart, believe it or not. That's where the fabric is, has been allowed and now I'll just work around this area. Now you may have your dart at the underarm or at the shoulder the same concept would apply. And I'm going to now go through the neckline. This wouldn't be the first tracing I would do if I were first tracing off a pattern. I wouldn't do a dart right away, but this is stage three as I, as I mentioned. And when I pull this up, I have a marking where I'll darken this for one dart leg and another. And let me just show you where it is. Here's my second dart leg. And here's the first one. Now the next step is to add seam allowances. And in the first program I detailed that, how to add 5 eighths of an inch seam allowances, how to add 1 and a fourth is usually the common width for the hem around the edges. And you can add that using your favorite tool. Let's get this unpinned. And you'll see lots of little perforations on your tissue and very light at this point. There are very light perforations around the neckline, around the armhole, but there aren't any, at this point, any seam allowances. But because this is quite difficult to see, I've taken the liberty of tracing another jacket front and outlining all of my perforated lines with a dark pen so that you can see a little bit more clearly what I was able to capture from the tracing. 
and what you'll see the pocket and all the and all the seam allowances and cutting lines. But then the dart, that's a very important part because the dart has to have a little underlay. But before we can contend with that, let's add the seam allowances and the hem allowance. The common widths to add are 5 eighths of an inch for the seam allowance is an inch and a fourth for the hem. And I've already started to put little dash marks where I had at 5 eighths of an inch. Just use a gauge of your choice and mark along 5 eighths of an inch. And then you can connect the lines with a ruler, whether it's curved or not. And then just keep connecting. And I'll just do it in the neckline area. But what's going to happen in the dart is that this is not, this my rough drawing is not going to be the underlay. What we're going to do is fold it as if it were sewn. Matching my initial seam lines. You can see how they've been matched. And I'm just going to pin it right now. And then cut along the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. Cut along the paper and kind of mold those together. And you would have to, of course, add these seam allowances and cut out it out. But when this unfolds, presto, then you'll have the dart underlay shape. Disregard my little extra pen mark there, but you can see the cutting line giving you enough fabric so that when it's sewn together, it will work out fine. I have a tissue paper in blue with all of my markings ready to cut out. So this is how you add shaping with a dart. If you haven't noticed by now, we're working backwards in the sewing segment, segments, working with the completed garment, how to pull a pattern from it for your own personal use. And on this jacket, to pull the pattern for the back area because of the pleating requires a little extra detail and knowledge. This is kind of like the stage four of working with copycat patterns. You also may have a pattern at home that you'd like to use some of the details from it that perhaps had gathers. You'd use the same kind of concept. Since the original garment is going to be your pattern, we have to find out some of the basic information. A, in this instance, being this, the center back seam allowance or the center back fold. I have pin marks along the center back and I found the center back by stacking the seam allowances and placing pins along the fold because I don't know exactly where the fold is in this area because of the already determined pleat. Now the pins, the green pins signify the depth of the pleat and it happens to be two and a half inches. So that's going to be a very significant measurement for me and then the length of this is four inches minus the seam allowances. So I have my pattern paper on my padded surface, the tracing paper, this because it's wide I have two widths of the tracing paper positioned and I'm going to make these two markings. Mark them with the four inches for the length of the tuck and then I'd like this two and a half inches. So you're working kind of with measurements as we need so often with sewing. So we mark those on the tracing paper and you'll see that in a minute. So I've just marked it through. The perforation line should give you some indication. And then also the red markings. It's light, I realize, for you, but you'll see it in just a few minutes. Now, to do the markings of this, and I'm not going to take time to go through the whole area, it might be best to unpin or unclip the front. There we go, so the garment can lie flat. I'm going to align the neckline at that marking that I just made at the neckline and place a pin. So we're working with it flat as before and placing the other pins at the, the edge of the fabric and you edge of the paper, pardon me. So used to working with fabric, I got it all lined now and just pinned down. So we have it positioned. Then flatten it out as before. You'd flatten out the hem, work from the flattest area first and as we did th throughout the first program and earlier, you trace the hemline, you trace the underarm seam so that it's nice and flat. And I would take at home a little bit more time than I'm doing right this minute to make sure that all areas are flat and trace. And now right now what I'm tracing is the underarm seam. And at the very underarm where I, the sleeve meets the underarm seam, I'm just placing a notch. Now, You'll find often on patterns that there's a notch where the sleeve meets the front and the sleeve meets the back. And I didn't mention this in the first, when I traced off the first part, 
But what you may want to do is put a notch marking just so that you know where the back would meet the front. And if you'd like to do that, it's certainly well within your reason to do this, leaving this pin in position until later. So I'm just right now going to trace part of the underarm seam. But right now we have a whole bunch of darts and tucks to contend with. So I'm going to release some of these pins, which already came released, and I'm going to pin the back tuck that's already been sewn to the marking, the two and a half inch marking that I have placed on the paper. So I, you can see I can release some of these so that I get the width. Now I want to straighten this until the dart, and because the front dart was three-fourths of an inch wide, I really pre-measured this, there are also back darts, they're also three-fourths of an inch wide. So I'm just going to accommodate for that dart. And then move this over three-fourths of an inch. Now, you may maybe can't see exactly what I'm doing, but you will be able to, I hope, in just a few minutes. So I've moved this over three-fourths of an inch. And that's where I have placed the pin in the dart leg, and I'm going to match those two together. So we're reverse process of sewing. We reverse the thinking process. And now we flatten this out and I realize it might be a little tricky to see, but I would trace the neckline and the remainder of the underarm seam. Just so that you can see what I just did, presto, we have another sample. And here's where the tuck was allowed. The tuck that was two and a half inches from the edge. The pattern would be cut on the fold of the fabric. And now you would need to add seam allowances, 5 eighths of an inch, and then the hem an inch and a fourth to an inch and a half, whatever your preference may be. On this particular pattern, everything has been matched. And here you can see I marked a little mar marking for the notch. Now you may wonder, you know, are these pieces going to fit together? Now I'm putting this together quite quickly. I've drawn these tissue patterns a little bit more hastily than when I did this originally. But you'll take a, a little bit more time when doing this, but I always check. Check to make certain that these pieces will come together. So at this point, it may be a good idea to take your front piece and your back piece. It's here somewhere underneath all of this paper and lay the two together. I had to admit that when I did the, my first tracing, I found that I had a fourth of an inch difference. I kind of walk the two seam allowances together as if I had sewn these to make sure that they're coming out. And I traced these pretty much the way I had it on my original pattern, and I was off by, oh, an eighth of an inch. And honestly, that is just fine with me because that's the fast way of, you can just kind of trim that off. If it were more than an eighth of an inch, well, then remeasure and double check your work. Now in the first program, I detailed how to work with collars and collar stays. And then the only difference on this jacket that we have is we didn't have a collar stay on the last jacket that we worked with, but the technique would be the same. The sleeve is not a set in sleeve, it's a raglan sleeve. And whoa, an easy one to trace off. It's almost a flat flat, very flat area, so you can just trace around the edges, but you do need to know where the grain line is. So here we have, I've marked just where one of the grain line areas is found on the pattern. Then marked one long line on the tissue paper and aligned the areas together. So I just pinned everything flat. I want to make a note that where that pin was marked to mark the notch for the front and the back. Let me just show you in the pattern. I kept the pin in the fabric so that I would have a notch marking. Just another guideline that we're so accustomed to having with sewing. So when you're working with patterns and you'd like to remove or lift off the pattern so that you could use it for another time, you just have to take some of these simple precautions into mind, lay things flat and trace each section as you go along and add seam allowances and then soon you'll have a copycat pattern. I'm sure that many of us have gone to a museum when they've had a special quilt display. 
and enjoyed the history and the beauty of the quilts. Or we visited a relative and they pulled out a quilt and we've enjoyed looking at it. Those quilts have many stories, but there are very few places around the country where there are museums dedicated exclusively just to quilting. And today we're fortunate enough to have some quilts from the Wisconsin Quilt Museum in Cedarburg, Wisconsin, and we have the president. Kay Walters is with us. And Kay, you're the president of the Wisconsin Quilt History Project in Cedarburg, and thanks for being with us. Thank you. For, it's a privilege to be here. We're going to start by showing a pattern that is really common, sewn in the early or late 1800s, early 1900s, and that's a crazy quilt. Yes, the crazy quilts were very popular in the latter part of the 19th century. This one was donated by um, Harry, uh, Harry Berkeley. It, it's a family piece, and the unusual thing about it is this crocheted edging on, on the edge here. Um, the family story is that it, would, it was the same filament that Thomas Edison used when he did his light bulbs, because Thomas used... Um, a Coates and Clark cotton thread that was carbonized. And the thread was used as part of the filament, filament in, light, in the, in the, in light the early light bulb. Oh my goodness, hardly could believe that this was used in the process of electricity. We have checked with We Energies and, and they can't find anything going back that far that would verify <laughs> that information, but it's part of the family history Lure, that's uh -huh. been sent down through and, the years. And it years. certainly makes a great story. Oh, it makes a wonderful story. <laughs> yes. And some quilts are not appreciated by all people because this next quilt is all trapuntoed. And tell us, Kay, the story of this quilt. Well, this was, it's a, it's a white on white quilt mm -hmm. um, that came into a thrift shop in our area in Ozaki County. And the director of the thrift shop looked at it and said, um, I think maybe the museum would be interested in it. Uh -huh. So they called us and I went and picked it up and I was just astounded. Um, <sighs> one of our directors is a, uh, an appraiser and she dates it at 1830s. And that would be our oldest quilt that we have. And wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be great if that quilt could tell us a story? Yes, yes. It, it's, it's so well done. One of the most difficult patterns to create, in my opinion, is a mariner's compass. Yes, I agree. All those points and... And this quilt was done by hand. Right. This mariner's compass was made in 1876 by, by Lizzie for her marriage to Frederick. And it, it's all hand done, hand <laughs> stitched, hand quilted. It's just a marvelous, um, marvelous piece of work. It, it is phenomenal. And you get lots of donations to your museum. Yes. And, and, what a, and this one, Genevieve Wainwright donated this quilt. Yes, Genevieve donated actually two quilts. Um, the one is the Muscatel grape pattern, which she did herself. She did all mm. the hand applique on it. And then her sister-in-law did the red poppy one, which you'll see next. Uh, but those, those were done in the 1930s. They were kits from the McElwain quilt shop in Walworth. And, and what a wonderful thing that the quilts were donated and hopefully people may have a prize and they could donate to a, a, another museum or a quilt museum. Speaking of museums, I'm impressed to show you this because your museum is going to expand. You have a barn designated to become a quilt to be a feature of the Quilt Museum. Yes, we have a beautiful barn from the 1850 to 1870s that we're going to turn into a year-round facility with, with climate-controlled storage for our textiles. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's got an addition to the, to the north. Uh, really a, a adventuresome project, but what a great place to store these beautiful quilts and the quilts for the future to tell the stories of quilters and their lives. Great place to show old textiles in an old historic building. Yes, it is. Well, Kay, thank you for being our guest on Sewing with Nancy and for sh sharing about the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. You can go to sewingwithnancy.com and click under Nancy's Corner. In the 2400 series, you'll be able to find information about this, the website that is available so that if you're in the area, if you come to Wisconsin to visit, you could do so.
and to see these beautiful quilts and appreciate them close up. Well, this is about the time to end our two-part series on copycat patterns, where I've shown you how to take a ready-made garment that you own and pull off a pattern and to make another garment or to incorporate some of these techniques. Hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for joining me. Bye for now. Nancy has written a fully illustrated book entitled Copycat Patterns, which includes all the information from this two-part series. It's $14.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the book, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com slash 2405. Order item number BK2405, Copycat Patterns. Credit card orders only. To pay by check or money order, call the number on the screen for details. Visit Nancy's website at SewingWithNancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman has been brought to you by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Studios, Clover, Amazing Designs, and Class A Needles. Closed captioning funding provided by Rowenta. Sewing with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.